So we're sitting there and we're having free drinks and, and appetizers on Clive, you know. And uh, he comes out and goes, okay, I've signed somebody new and I want you all, if you're a publisher in here, you want, you want to go back and find me songs. And if you're a writer, then you've got to go write songs. And he brought out... Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. It's Shaw. Thank you for returning. And for new uh, subscribers, thank you so much. Today, I'm very excited to welcome Judy Stakey to the show. Judy is a well-known and renowned artist development specialist. She's also an author and a speaker, and she's got over four decades of music experience. And she's earned an industry reputation of championing people, developing them, signing them. And these are people such as Katy Perry, Sheryl Crow, Michelle Branch. And she was Senior VP of Creative at Warner Chapel Music as well. And Warner Chapel is a the publishing arm of Warner Music, you know, home to some of the greats like uh, Madonna, Prince, Fleetwood Mac, ACDC, Cher, Diddy, and of course, my old time faves, Led Zeppelin, just to name a few. And, you know, she signed, she developed, she managed many acts, and she's going to talk about her experience, how she got into it. It's so interesting. And just, there's a lot of synchronicity and divine intervention and life path. All of that is involved in her story. And Judy's worked with so many fantastic people like Clive Davis. And we talk a lot. She gives a very, very interesting story about Clive, So, it, which involves a very famous artist. So stay tuned for that. It's, it's amazing. And she was there for it all. And uh, Judy has also written a book, The Songwriter's Survival Guide. So the links will all be in the show notes. And Judy also started her own company based on her motto, it all starts with a song. So she helps to uh, develop people to, you know, if you think you have a gift, if you feel that you can write songs, be it lyrics, music and lyrics, all of it, then Judy can help you with that. She can critique, she can, uh, you know, listen, she can give you what you need to move it forward and to develop it. She literally is that artist development part of the artist's career. And so we're going to talk about all of that. She also, you know, these retreats, she's going to start a nonprofit to fund the, the retreats. But at the moment, the retreats are still going. So please check out her website and get some more information there. And, you know, we talk about a lot of what we enjoy about music and how much it shaped us because music has it's one of those experiences but you know we have many so obviously if you've grown up with certain toys or for some people it was pac-man uh for some people it was a big wheel uh you know for some people it was your baby dolls and whatever it may be you know for a lot of us it was getting that album taking it out of its sleeve, you know, you, you had the smell of the vinyl or whatever it was, <laughs> vinyl. And then the sleeve, which had the lyrics mostly, most of the times, has the lyrics and then the artwork. And it was a whole experience. And I don't want to sound like the old lady shouting at clouds, but we just don't have that anymore. <laughs> and we it was so refreshing to just talk about that. I also asked Judy a lot about uh, today's music industry, and I think you'll be very surprised at what she's saying today about about um, uh, the current state of today's music industry. It's very, very interesting stuff, and you know, I think you'll enjoy this interview. So, welcome to the show, Judy. Judy, nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Great stuff. So you've got such an interesting career. I want to start out by asking you, how did you first come to know that you had an affinity with music or that you were drawn to music? Was music in the home? How did that happen? 
Well, my mother always says that I came out of the womb singing and dancing. So we have that. Um, you know, I think like most children, it's like, I just loved music. I mean, I just sang and danced and um, I had two sisters and a brother and my mom, yes, my mom, you know, she played violin, you know, when she was younger and she danced and she sang and my dad thought he could sing. Um, but there was always music going and we were always, it was just, I couldn't imagine a life without music. I couldn't imagine like even going to a job where they're, they weren't playing music, you know, it was just, um, it was just part of my life. So I knew from a very, very early age. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Did you have any aspirations to do anything else? Yes. Wow. I, well, no, um, I really would have loved to have gone to Broadway, you know, try to make it as an artist myself. Um, but as I always say, I didn't have me growing up. I didn't have someone to coach me and to guide me. My parents were wonderful and they supported me, but they didn't know how to tell me how to do that. And, you know, there was no internet back in, back when I went to school. So you can't, how do I, you know? Um, so I always, I mean, I, I, I kind of landed in music. I, I, the universe was watching out for me. So it was always music. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. But during the years, I've always picked up other things that like I'm I'm a closet photographer. So I did photography for a long time on the side. I now, you know, I write books now also. So it's like um, music is always really at the or, or the artistic creative process is always at the core of it. Um, but I've always made my money from music. <laughs> Let's say that. Yes. I mean, very few people start out, you know, where they, they, they start, you know, so right. it sounds right. like you, yes, you, it sounds like the path was paved. And into a job that cha nobody knows about this job. You know, I mean, I, I, I would have to keep repeating myself to my mother and she's like, you do what? I said, well, I sit around and I listen to songs and I guide songwriters and I, I sign them and I help them and I develop them and I market them and songwriters. And she's like, songwriters, I'll, like the people that write the songs for other artists. And she was like, what do you do? What? You know, she couldn't, under, you know, it, it's a very, it was a very foreign thing. Nowadays, of course, it's a little bit more common, but here was a job that I had no idea even existed. And the path was just like somebody came with a machete and just cleared the path and went, that's you go. Cause I, I, I've never left. I was tempted many times to go into other parts of the, the music business and to, to the record companies. And it just never, it, it, it never, it never filled me up. Like, like publishing did like developing songwriters, because what I got to do is I got to sit with somebody and say, okay, so what's going on in your life? What would you like to write about? How would you like to say it? From what perspective? Let's see what you've got. Let's read it. Let's go over it. Let's edit it. It was all about that process of helping them figure out what they wanted to communicate and how they wanted to say it. Yeah. How, how wonderful to be able to, that was my job to sit every day and talk to another human being about what was going on in their life and how best to present it to the world so that other people would be able to to um, to share that share that feeling and 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 to and to become you know and to be vulnerable like us that yeah. is incredible yes talk yeah. about divine intervention though yeah. that's just oh yeah um, yeah i am i am exactly where i'm supposed to be i really feel that absolutely and let's just talk about because you've worked with one of the most i'm going to use the word infamous He's famous, but he's also infamous. <laughs> um, A and R execs, uh, record company execs. Uh, I want to almost say the honorable, but Mr. Clive Davis. I mean, he's oh, just yeah. so <laughs> yes, so well known yeah. for for finding and signing people. Uh, Janis Joplin. I mean, wow. First of all, it's hard to believe he was even around them, but he was. <laughs> uh, Whitney. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, my goodness, who? Are, oh, Alicia Keys, one of my favorite bands, Chicago. I, I'm a band. I love bands. So, Chicago. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Errol Smith, of course, Bruce Springsteen. I mean, he is infamous. Yeah. 
And yes, you, totally. you, worked, you worked for him. Can you tell us a little bit about that process and and did, how did it sort of educate you to move forward or to move on? That's, that's a really great question um, because I was with Clive during my formative years. <laughs> so, you know, I'm this fresh kid out of college. I'm 18 years old, uh, 20, 21 years old and, you know, not quite sure what I'm going to do. And I, I met a woman who came from New York to be in the music business. And I went, go, go follow. I'll follow you. You know, where's the music business, you know? And so um, I, you know, I walked into this wonderful world and, um, and got right into publishing, but I started out as a secretary, someone not knowing how to type because I was a music major. So I never had to do papers really so I never typed. Um, and then my first job was as an assistant. Um, but I learned at Arista, I was there for seven years and I started as an assistant and I ended, I, I left as a general professional manager of the publishing company. It was small, um, but I was the main creative person, the song plugger. Um, we we're called song pluggers and I'll be using that term. And um, no matter what title I had, I was still a song plugger. And what that meant is, I would have my writers that were signed to me and they would write me songs. And then I would go plug those songs into a project. So I would, somebody would play me a song and I go, oh, it's great for Faith Hill. Let me go and call Missy and Missy, I've got a song from Faith Hill who, you know, who was looking for her, the manager and would go over and, and, uh, and actually the producer, manager of the producer um, and would go play it for her. And then Faith Hill would cut it and then we'd all make money. So I was a song plugger. Um, Clive is, is an amazing executive, okay? He knew how to create the community within the, within the building, within the structure. Um, he had marketing meetings every single Friday. Now the publishing company wasn't involved as much as sometimes we'd get to be, um, but we, but everybody, like we were housed with the record company. So those marketing meetings every week would spill out and go, okay, these are the artists that we need songs for. You, we got to work on this. We got to work on this. And so the communication was so amazing. And the open door of sending him songs and him getting back to you. And, you know, there was, he was accessible, accessible. Mm -hmm. And he was a great executive. And so you, when, when you're growing up, you, you leave college, you leave your parents' house, you leave this institution that you've been in and you're flying out into the world. And all of a sudden you get a boss that doesn't return any of his phone calls. You know, those are the habits that you, 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 um, that you, uh, you know, you develop as you grow older. And all of a sudden you're, you know, 20 years in the business and you don't return people's phone calls. So, I was, I'm really happy that I was in the footsteps of Clive and my immediate boss, Billy Michelle, who's the president of the publishing company, that there was this, yes, we were creative, but we were also professional. Um, and I really thank him for that. I really do. Um, I have a, I have a great Clive story actually, that's, um, that's in my book that I've, I'm just about finished with. Um, it's a, a book about my all the writers that I developed and and my time in the music business. Um, but this was Clive, and this was all over. So he, you know, back then there was no internet. So in the in the mail, I got an invitation addressed to me, and um, and uh, it was it was an invitation to come to this this bar, um, you know, on a Tuesday night, and. Um, he, he was, he was, he was gathering. He, I don't know how he put it, but he was, he was there to introduce us to somebody he had just signed. So we all go down there and every publisher in town. And this time there was a lot of them. It wasn't the, you know, it was, it was, it wasn't like the few that are there. I mean, there's a lot today, but there wasn't just the few companies. Um, there was Virgin and there was RCA and there was Sony, uh, Columbia, there was Epic, there was Warner Brothers Records, there was Electra Records, there was, a, there was so many different record companies and publishing companies. And so you were in this room with all these other people. And so we're sitting there and we're having free drinks and, and appetizers on Clive, you know, and uh, he comes out and goes, okay, I've signed somebody new and I want you all 
if you're a publisher in here, you want you want to go back and find me songs. And if you're a writer, then you've got to go write songs. And he brought out Whitney Houston and he brought her out. She was 16 or 17 years old. And she came out with this three piece combo and she sang a few songs. And we all were like, I mean, gaping at the whole thing. And we couldn't get out of the room fast enough to go find songs for her, you know. Um, but he was always doing he was always he always was. was involving the songwriters he 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 respected he respects he's still alive he respects songwriters um and he he's the champion of them and so in turn um in turn we wanted to work harder for him you know we wanted we wanted to get on his projects mm -hmm. i held a song for two years not up and down and up and down two years not knowing and it ended up on the bodyguard soundtrack so you trusted Clive. He's like, trust me. I, I've, I've got this. You know, it's like, okay, okay. <laughs> yes. And he delivered though. It sounds like. No, he, he always crazy. delivered. He delivered. He delivered. Yeah. I mean, he was meticulous about, you know, making sure the mix was right and making sure every word was right and everything. He was meticulous. He was, he's a, he's a great record guy. Really great. Yeah. And Atlantic, weren't they? They were around as well. Um, yeah, Atlantic is part of the um, Warner system. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, because Warner Chapel. So, yes. Yeah, so let's talk about that because you you were also um, VP of creative, creative, um, VP of creative. Yes, yes. Or I was senior VP of creative at Warner Chapel Music. So I went from Arista which was attached to Arista Records. And then I went to Screen Gems, which is uh, for three years, which was part of the Capital System, Capital EMI record system. And then I went to Warner Chapel, which was part of the Warner system, which is Warner, Atlantic, Electra, and, and Sire and others. Um, I always was with a publishing company that was attached to a record company. I loved the synergy. I loved the access, you know? Yes. Yeah. And so yeah, I was, a, go ahead. Has it changed? Sorry, has that changed a bit? Um, it, the process. I mean the the business. Yes. The, I mean the business. Yes and no. I mean you know the traditional business is still there. There's record companies and they sign acts and they put promotion teams together and you know I mean they have a promotion team and they market you and they do. The main difference is is that that pre pre the internet pre pre you know the transition that we all went through. You had to have a record company. You, they were the ones that had the studios and the and they knew the producers and could distribute. You know I mean, fine, you made a record, but who would distribute for you? That's always within this Camelot. You know, it's it's within this this uh, um, this wonderful fortress behind. You know, that was the music business. Now, anyone can make a record. You can buy the machine. You can go on YouTube. You can learn how to to do it, and you can put out your own record. You can. Uh, there's other ways to distribute. You can you can distribute on Amazon and iTunes. So you don't need a huge record company. What what the difference is is that with a record company, it's all there. You just walk in and it's all there. It's like walking into Bloomingdale's and going, "I need a bathing suit. I need a parka. I need snowshoes, and I need beach sandals." And you're it's all there. Independently, you're gonna have to go over here to one shop over here at another shop, over there to another. Same thing, you're gonna to have to pick people. You're gonna to have to hire a promotion guy, a marketing guy, a lawyer, a publicity person, a publisher. So you have to be, you're just doing the hiring. It's that, that's the big difference. Right, okay. No. I suppose, um, but you know, I, oh, so Warner Chapel, yes. Warner so Chapel. You are the global, so, the, so they're the publishing arm. Of oh, Warner, the oh, Warner oh, Music System, okay. yes. So Warner, Warner Music System is the is the the headline, yes. you know, the, the 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 head, and then the Warner Records, Atlantic Records, you know, all of that, and then you have the publishing division, and then you have the film division, you know, you have all of that. Um, so twenty years, twenty years, senior vice president, and loved every minute of it, practically every minute of it. <laughs> um, I was. Um, I was, I, my department was really divided into two sections and um, half of half of it was uh, my stable of songwriters, staff songwriters, who I got to pay a stipend, a monthly 
you know, a monthly um, salary. And so they wouldn't have to have a job. Um, uh, so they wouldn't have to have a job and they could write full time for me. Ooh. And their job was to write songs for Faith Hill and Britney Spear and Josh Groban and Amy Grant and whoever else needed songs throughout the years. Okay. But that was their job. So every week they'd come in and go, Judy, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? What do you think of this? You know, and I'd be like, I like this. I don't like this. Let's work on that verse. Let's work on this. And I would help develop and shape them. I was their coach. I was their mentor. I was their mirror is what I, what I called it. Um, and then I met a woman in 1989 named Cheryl Crow, and I kind of fell in love, professional love, and I I signed her and developed her in, and helped her get a record deal and into her into her artist deal and you know now nav navigated her into that and really loved that process so. I started building, I had my stable of songwriters that I was working and being so, plugging their songs to everybody. And then I started develop, signing and developing artists who were write, songwriters also um, and developing and helping them on their course. And after Cheryl, I got known as the chick singer songwriter publisher. So it then came Jewel and Michelle Branch and Joy Williams and Katy Perry and quite a few others and and a few boys in there too but but the, you know that i i really enjoyed um i enjoyed the singer songwriter i love bands i love bands too just like you Shaw. um but um but when you're developing a band it's like having five children at once and this one wants to go there and when this one's you know and you're just like guys you know it's like how trying to wrangle them all in to get the most i did was a band called for king and country who are huge in the christian marketplace huge um and it was two brothers uh, but that was the most i took <laughs> wow. uh, at least they were brothers so i knew that no matter what if they fought they'd always come back together <laughs> um so i you know i i i loved my job i was there and plugging songs and developing and and just enjoying the hell out of life and then you know 2005 came along and my my explanation is that we had the perfect storm of the internet growing up and making everybody responsible the the cost of going from paper to digital you know the cost of every company having to hire temps to come in and take every single piece of paper, every contract, every license, every single piece of paper had to be entered into the computer or else you didn't get paid. I mean, if my information was in, I didn't get paid. Think about it, everything's computerized, but you had to put all the paper in. So the companies had to spend loads of money hiring people to put all this stuff into the computer, okay? So there was a cost. And then the recession came because after 9-11, all of a sudden in 2004, 2005, we're in a recession. Those doors, I always say, the, the Warner Chapel was this wonderful castle, you know, we were all inside. Well, they they closed that, that, that drawbridge up and drained that moat and no one came in and no one came out and no fun. We weren't getting any money. We couldn't, we couldn't spend anything. I mean, it was was hard times. I mean, that's when they started laying everybody off and the music business changed because those companies couldn't keep spending the way that they were spending and not, not getting the returns that they were getting. And that's when really the music business changed. I lasted another four years at Warner Chapel until 2009. And then I left and started my own company. Mm. And the business is, the business is great in what they do. They, I mean, the marketing and promotion and distribution and branding that they can do on, on, on bands these days and the outlets that they have. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And they're coming up with new platforms all the time. Um, but there was no room for the development process. And the development process is you're in kindergarten. 
You know, you don't need much money. As I always said, it's like my department cost, the, uh, like I signed people for so less money. You know, it was a tuna fish sandwich and a journal and a, in a, in a pencil, you know, it's in a guitar and you'd be fine, you know, for hours. It's, but you need that, you need that sand pit to fall down in, you know, you need that playground in order to go, let me see what this sounds like. Let me see what this sounds like. Let me see what happens with this co-writer so that you get the hang of it. And then once they get the hang of it, it's like they're off to the races, but they need that time to develop. So that's why I started my own company um, based on, um, based on my methodology that it all starts with a song that you can have an amazing career in this business if you start with the songs. If your songs are great, then you can go anywhere. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Yeah. You know? And that reminds me of your TED Talk, which I watched the other day. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, it all starts with a song. It was wonderful. Yeah, you know, at first I was thinking, why are they so quiet? And then I realized they were in Paris. So <laughs> Right. The light Parisians. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, the whole day. It was we were there for, you know, eight, eight or nine hours or whatever. Well, I was there for a lot longer. Because they, they do it just one after another after another. Those people were sitting for a long time. Oh, yeah. It's amazing how they do it. But thank you. Thank you. Oh, you know, it's wonderful. Because I always say, once you do a TED Talk, that's it. You're you're there. <laughs> you're there now. You know. But, it does give you some credibility. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It really does. And it was great. But, yes, I can see what you're saying. Oh, gosh, there's so much. So just going back to the issue of artists and repertoire or artist development as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that, ex I guess it exists. I don't see it in all I know is when I was growing up, it was a lot of it was word of mouth, you know, mm -hmm. the Zep albums coming or, you know, the new, you know, something's coming. Gino Vanelli is new or you, you would hear bits and pieces out and then you go to the record store a record store as Prince would say and then you get your album you sit down you look at the lyrics and speaking of which that was just a part of it wasn't it you couldn't wait to open up that sleeve sit down oh, put the, the way it smells oh, oh and smell it and then <laughs> read the lyrics and think about what did they mean I wonder which who wrote that and and you know what you were saying I hear you Yes, but also like with the Jacksons, because when I was growing up, Holland Dozier Holland wrote their song. So we talk about songwriting. But when they started writing their own, I, you know, as a, as a consumer, I would say, oh, gosh, I wonder which Jackson wrote that, you know. So right. but does that even and, and speaking of artists development, I mean, that group. But I wonder if that exists. Do they nurture because you are a born mentor, I, I believe. Do you, I wonder if there are mentors for people like that who help who's helping them these days? Well, yeah, I think there are. I think that there are more nowadays than there have been, mm -hmm. um, mainly because and I think Zoom had a lot to do with this. OK, I'll back up for a second. So I put on songwriting retreats. Okay. I've been doing it since 2015. I take a week and I find a wonderful retreat. I did, um, I did a couple of, I did three of them in France. Um, uh, but I usually do them like in Nashville, Tennessee. And I, I, I take everybody away for a week and, and they get to learn. Okay. And they, I take them through my methodology and they really go through a process. So at the end of the week, they have a map of where, the, what they need to do if they really want to make this a career. And so before, before the pandemic, I was doing 12 a year. I had no competition. Mm -hmm. I still don't have any competition because I think I am in, a, I'm in a league of my own and what I teach. Okay. Um, but with zoom came opportunity for all these people who all of a sudden now maybe not on the road and all of a sudden the guitar player is like, Oh, I'll teach you how to play guitar. I'll teach you how to play guitar, you know, to do this, or I'll teach you how to write, or I'll teach you how to, how to produce. I mean, Ryan Tedder has got a program on Zoom that he, he you'd sign up and he'll teach you production. So 
With that came an influx of teachers, retreats, workshops, the whole bit. So the access to, to learn and to develop yourself is there. I think it's more the mindset of the artist and the right the songwriter. Okay. Because there's oh it's always there's there's always been this um story that you know you I can sing, I can write songs, I'm pretty good, I want to go get a record deal, I want to go get a publishing deal. And I'm gonna go do that, and then they're gonna help me go and do everything. So there's a lot of people that still live with that, and and that's how it used to happen, by the way. You know, I would get a call from a manager who said, you know, I just signed this, this artist, you know, who's also a writer. I want to bring him over. And I would, that's how I signed quite a few people. The manager, my friend, Larry Tolan brought Tim James over, who was signed to Sony. They brought him over. Tim played for me. I was like, you're fantastic. I'll sign you. Um, and, and that's how it happened. Okay. But nowadays you don't need the record company and the record companies are not going to look at you as, as um, they're not going to be as excited about you if you haven't done the work. They want somebody with followers. They want somebody who's put on a show, who knows how to do that. They want somebody who's writing great songs. They don't want to do the development. There's still people in the traditional music business that develop, absolutely, but it's not their main focus. That's why they TikTok is great because they can they sign TikTok artists, you know, that have all you know millions of downloads and they're writing these. Priscilla Block is a huge country star. She came off of TikTok. Now, what they're also finding is that there's a lot of one hit wonders that these people, you know, they have one thing and then there's nothing to back it up. So there's a you know, there's plus and minuses with everything. But in the rest of the world, okay, we have the traditional music business on one side, but in the rest of the world, artists and writers, if they want to have this as a career, they're going to have to, they're going to have to, they're going to have to, to, to be willing to hire and to listen to other people and put them on their team. They're that if you were a cook and you wanted to be become a great cook, you would go take a cooking lesson. You would go get a mentor. You would go do an internship. You would do whatever you would have to do. And you'd have to do knives and baking and frying and all the different things. Well, if you want to be a songwriter, if you want to be an artist, okay, which is one and the same thing these days, okay, there's songwriters or artists. Some of them may not put everything out, but they're all artists. Um, you're going to need help and it's figuring out what you need help in. That's, that's another important thing because it's, you know, I've, I've, I do one-on-one -on -one consultations and I've had many, many of many an artist sit in front of me and go, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. And it's like, okay. So I, I developed a methodology that is easy to look at your life through a filter so that you can at least go, okay, wait a minute. I've got most of this. I just need help here. Oh, you mean if I just learned how to do this little part over here, everything else is fine? Well, then who do I hire? Who? Do, what class do I take? What YouTube video do I have to watch? You know, I mean, you've got I've got I've got artists that are brand new and and learning how to write, and I've got an artist who is finishing her her first EP. And now has to go do all the homework on how is she going to market it? What does she need to do? I said, that's not my expertise. I'll be right there with you. I said, and I know enough to tell you. I said, but there are classes. Work. We'll find you a class. We'll find you a workshop. We'll find you a guide. We'll find you a YouTube video. We'll find you, you but you've got to now do, go and do that homework if you're going to start marketing. You know, it's like, well, why can't I just hire somebody to market? It's like, how do you hire somebody to market something that you don't know how to market? If you don't know how to market yourself, how are you going to guide anybody else to market you? You need to know what it entails. You need to know what to do. So it's, it's a different, it's, it's a mindset. 
it's a different mindset. I've had quite a few clients who have paid my consulting fee and sat here and I have given them a map and told them what they wanted to do and they didn't want to put the work in. And that's, that's their prerogative. But they're, you know, it's like when you tell somebody, it's like, this is what you're going to have to do. It's like, no, I'm just going to do it my way. <laughs> you know, so it's a mindset. It's a yeah. mindset of for the rest of my life, I'm going to have to have guides and mentors and mirrors and coaches and teachers in my life, no matter what profession you're in. Mm -hmm. I walk with an attorney in the morning and he was off to some seminar on Saturday that he was like, oh, I have to be there all day. I said, what are you doing? He's like, well, to, I, in order to, you know, they renew your license, since you have to take, you know, certain classes to keep up with the law and to keep up with things. So this is what I got to do. Doctors have to do it, you know. So it's it's a mindset of like, if I'm going to have this, if I want to create my my perfect life and have this wonderful life, I'm going to need people to help me. Absolutely. Yeah, and we have to do it as therapists as well. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you know, the record companies used to do the marketing, didn't they? I know the artists yeah. used to contribute. They're doing marketing now. They're doing the, yeah, yeah. They're doing that kind of development. Oh, absolutely. They're doing the marketing development, branding and promotion. They're developing the artist, but they now would rather have the artist developed. They don't want a kindergartner. They would rather have somebody who's graduating from high school, let's say. Okay. Who's been doing it, who knows the ropes, who knows what's going on, who they can take and go, you know what? Within a year, we could start making money. Amazing. Yeah. But that is a big change. Uh, <clears throat> no, it's no, a change because well, one more thing, because in the, in the old days, what they used to do in the old days, listen to me, um, aging myself, um, they would sign an artist. And he, I, I mean, I had an artist at one record company that he was there for five, six years. He made one album. Well, it, five, six years without making any music. Okay. So that's that's the other part of they shouldn't be developing <laughs> you know it's like that part of he was a kid and you know he needed development but not at the record it's like he needed to to be developed with a within a publishing company with, before he even got to the record company you know but it was just it was too long a process yeah oh, yes yeah. but they, you mentioned a couple of things your methodology as well mm -hmm. This is a method to every uh, thing that we do. Uh, yes. So you explain a little bit about what you do. You do help artists find what they're good at or what they can do and how they may develop it in songwriting. But it sounds as though it, it also applies to their career, to the to all yes. aspects of their career. Yes. So yes. can you talk just a little bit about that? What will happen if yes. someone comes to you and says, right, I need help in this area. How would you help them? Um, I start two ways. I first want to hear their story. I want to hear from their lips, from their mouth. I want to hear how they tell me their story of how they started, how, you know, how, what the process was like. And now that they're here today, what do they want? All right. So I get to hear that whole story, which I'm now playing a movie. You know, I've got the characters up. I can see what everyone's doing. You know, I've got I'm trying to get a perspective. Um, and then we listen to songs. We listen to their songs so that I get an idea of who they are and what, you know, maybe they had parents who weren't supportive or who were supportive, you know? So I take all of these into, maybe they had lessons, maybe they never had lessons. Maybe they just started doing this. Maybe they never, maybe they've been doing this for a long time and are stuck. There's so many different scenarios that can happen. So I have to take that in consideration. And then I listen to their songs and we, and I critique, I go through the songs as far as how they can make them better. Okay. So I'm a, I'm a really great critiquer. I've I'm actually a songwriter myself. I actually have a song on Spotify. I'm very proud of um, from an artist that I co-wrote with. Um, so mm -hmm. I've got a lot of experience in, in delving into, and I've created um, a language that is also helpful. So let me, let me go back for one second. Cause I'm going to explain my methodology. 
But the first thing I want to explain is that in order to create a creative process must be in place. Meaning if you want to make a cake, then you're going to need a couple hours in the kitchen. You're going to need a kitchen and you're going to need for tools, you're going to need a bowl and a spoon and measuring cups and a mixer and chocolate and eggs and vanilla and flour. You're going to need all these tools in order to make your cake. So if you're a songwriter, and when I say songwriter, whether you're writing for other people or you're an artist, but you're a songwriter, okay, you're going to need a couple of hours to write a song. You're going to need a bedroom, a studio, a living room. You're going to need the space to do it. And you're going to need a guitar, a piano, a mic, a computer, a pencil, a journal, maybe a co-writer in the room. What do you need to make your songs? So the first thing I do with a client is we sit down and go, okay, what is your creative process? Where do you write? Well, I write, you know, in the backyard and I don't, or I don't have a place to write or I don't, I don't know where I want to write. You know, it's like getting them a space that they feel creative in. Making the time. Let's if you if if you need to make a time every single week. If you want to do this, more than that, but let's start out with every Tuesday from six to nine, you're gonna write songs. That's that's your committed. You've got an appointment every week. So you've got the space, you've got the time, and then I'm gonna give you some tools to start off with besides your guitar and your piano and your pencil and your journal and things like that. Okay. So these are the, my methodology are the tools that you form your creative process with. They're the foundation of your creative process. And it's very simple. My methodology is based on two questions. And the question one is what is a song? And a song is the, the integration of your voice, your lyrics and your melody. Okay. So if you want your songs to be great, then you're going to have to make sure your voice or your demo singer's voice, whoever's singing the demo is great, okay? You're going to have to make sure that your lyrics, your stories are great, and you're going to have to make sure that your melodies are great. So if we take those three things, okay, and say, okay, I'm listening to your song, Shaw, you've come to me and I've listened to your songs and I go, wow, Shaw, you've got an amazing voice. Wow, really, really impressive. And whoever you've been co-writing these songs with, they're, I love the melodies and a lot of, the, lot of the, um, the style that you're doing is great. Your lyrics, I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not connected to. I think that I'm missing some of the story. I think that's where you're losing people. I think that's that's where we need the work. So it's a filter. So I can look at your songs and go, let me see, is it the voice? Is it the lyric or is it the melody? Now, with like if we say within the lyric, it could be a million things within this. Maybe you're, you're using way too many metaphors. Maybe you don't know how to rhyme. Maybe you don't know how, maybe you're listing things and not telling me a story. There's so many things within there. And we go in and we figure it out. And and then it's about, okay, let's teach you how to write a story in a short amount of time. And in your style, with your words and your language, how do you put these words together? So you've got the voice, the lyric, and the melody. That's those are the three things that 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 we we look at your your songs through that, those filter. The second question in my methodology is how do you get better? How do you develop yourself? You develop yourself by your bot with your body, your mind, and your soul. We experience this 3D reality through our body, through our minds, through our souls. We are experiencing this, this podcast here. I am sitting in a chair. I've got a table in front of me. Um, my my body is um you know, it's cool. It's like a nice 68 degrees. And so my body is reading the room. Mm -hmm. My mind, our minds are reading the room. You and I are sharing information. We're going back and forth. We're learning. We're excited, you know, all that. And our souls are reading the room and saying, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be scared of. This is kind of cool. This is kind of exciting, you know? So that's how we read the room. If we want something to change in our lives, 
We need to change something in our body, our minds, and our souls. So if you came to me and said, I want to be a star athlete, I want to go to the Olympics, I'd say, okay, first thing we're going to do is no more ding-dongs and you're on chicken with, with no skin on it. For you know, That's it. We're changing your diet. We're, you're going to be running every day. We're, we're going to concentrate on that body. Your mind, well, if you want to go to the Olympics, I've got three volumes, five inches thick each one that you're going to have to read in order to go to the Olympics to know everything you got to know. And your soul, well, your confidence has been a little low. So we're going to have to go and, you know, maybe talk to a therapist or maybe you need a week, a yoga retreat for a weekend, something that you can get back into your heart space. It's the same thing with, with songwriters. So the voice doesn't exist without the body. So if the body is not in, in shape, and I don't mean that the outer, the, what you look like, I mean, inside, if your diet, sleep and exercise are not, are not. Um, taking care of this avatar, then how do you expect your voice to communicate? I know when I don't feel good, my voice is not pleasant. Mm -hmm. I can become a real witch at times if I'm not feeling good. So how would I, how do I create my life if I'm not feeling good? Your lyrics are words. They are words that, you know, there's a billion words out there. We, we, it's a game in how you put it together. That involves the mind. If your mind is sharp and your mind is clear and you've had enough sleep and you've eaten, then your mind is, is, is alert so that you can decide whether you want to use conscious or consciously. You know, it's, it's, it's a game, but your mind has to be involved, but it has to be sharp. And your soul is where your melodies live. It's where all your emotions are. And your emotions are melodies, your, your, the melodies are your emotions realized. When you're happy, we want to sing, I'm crazy about you, baby. And when we're sad, you know, oh, some, somebody loves you. It's no good unless they, you know, you want to sing these loud, like these sad songs. But that's what realizes your emotions. But it's being able to have your emotions, to be able to, you know, it all goes back to when you've had good sleep and you're taking care of yourself and your mind is sharp, then your soul is happy. It's, you know, it, it all goes hand in hand. So it's the voice, the lyric, the melody, the body, the mind, and the soul. It's those six components that make up the foundation of the creative process, of, of the creative process that I invite you to look at. Um, because it, again, when you come to me and we stand there and we look at the six things and I go, Sha, well, okay, your voice is great. Check that off. And your melodies are fantastic. Okay, we got to work on your lyrics. And you know what? I'm really concerned about the fact that you're not getting enough sleep. Let's look at that. You know, you're still waking up in the middle of the night. You know, so what do you do right before you go to sleep? Oh, you're on your screen for two hours going through Facebook in bed. You know, I think that could be the problem. Now, I use that example because that is what I find with my, I'm an adjunct professor in, at some colleges uh, at Belmont in, in Nashville. And um, um, I'm sorry, just <laughs> I had so many thoughts coming through my head. Um, and that's what that's what they usually say when I have them keep a calendar for a week and they come back and their oh, their sleep is all like over the place. And I'm like, well, so what do you do before you go to sleep? And they're like, well, we're on our phones. And I'm like, OK, let's try an experiment. Let's put our phones down and be in bed for like an hour or an hour and a half before you go to sleep without your phones, you know? And they all they all come back and go, I slept so much better last night. But that's what we look at. That's we have look. a filter, just and, like you, yeah. Yeah, and do some people come to you who may not be uh, musicians or they may not play instruments, but they're very good at writing lyrics? And they yes. Want yeah. Yes, and it's easier today, actually, um, I have one client who doesn't, I mean, she plays a few chords, but she's not a musician and she needs somebody else in the room. And until she finds the, that person in the room, she goes on to the Google <laughs> and types in um, uh, musical tracks to write songs to. And there are websites and you can go buy a track for $10. You can go listen to a track for free. I mean, there's, you, you can't, you 
if you want to download the whole song, you have to pay for it, but you can listen, listen to a little bit and go, Ooh, that that's kind of cool. That gives me an idea. Okay. I can, I like that tempo. And, you know, so you, so you get an idea of what you want. Um, but, and, and then say for that, then you go find somebody to write with. And that's kind of fun. It's fun to find someone that, um, that you, that you can sit in a room with for, you know, two or three hours and just toss ideas back and forth and, and make a song. Yeah. And I suppose people can choose. So when they come to you, are the retreats different from the personal tutelage or having to being tutored by you personally, as opposed to going to the retreats? Obviously there's a time limit, I suppose, with the retreats. Um, yeah, well, the, the the retreat is taking you through my methodology. You live my methodology. You get there and we do yoga every morning. We They eat healthy. I mean, I'm, I don't starve them by, by it. And it's really great food. But, you know, th there's not a, like a hot fudge sundae at the end of the night. And there's no pizza. And, you know, it's it's healthy food. Um, they, they have lessons. They learn. They do exercises. I show them videos. They co-write every day with, with two other people. They perform their songs that they wrote that day. Um, there's I, there's a curriculum. There's a curriculum that I take them through. So it, there's a process. So they come out, out at the end of the week. Their hearts are blown wide open. They're, they are filled with so many tools and so many tricks so that when they do come across you know, a struggle or a challenge, they have now a way to go around and go through it and, and deal with it. Um, they have connections. They have, you know, a, a couple dozen other writers there that now are their class that, you know, they've bonded and they can reach out to and they co-write with and they talk to. And, you know, that that I think is one of the most amazing things that they get to do. And they get to leave their life. They get to leave their life for a week and come and do something that they they really love to do. They get to develop themselves. Um, and they don't have to think about anything. I mean, literally everything's thought about, you know, it's like, I'll tell you when to wake up. I will tell you when to go to bed. I will tell you when we're doing yoga. I will tell you when we're going to eat. I will tell you what to eat. I will tell you who you're going to write with. I'm going to, and you're like, you just have to show up with this open mind and, and immerse yourself in it. That's the beauty of a retreat. And I always say, it's like, I do a retreat every year. I, I don't do, it's not a songwriting retreat. I'd love to do one of those these days, one of these days. Um, be a guest at my own writing retreat. Um, but taking the week off is just, I mean, you you need the time. You know that. I mean, you you need the time. The wonderful things about, the wonderful thing about um, one-on-ones is that it's just about you. Okay. So most people that have come to me have either that I, that I do my one-on-one -on -one consultations have either been to a retreat or after talking to me, then they do come to a retreat. So they're all, they've read the book. They, they get the, they get the methodology. They may not live it like you do at a retreat, but they all, they all, they all have that in their practice. Yeah. And you mentioned your book. Uh, I want to ask you about both because you, you're you're in the process of writing your other book as well. Your right. next, but the survival guide to songwriting or the songwriter mm. survival guide, what prompted you to, to write that book? Honestly, my brand manager, my amazing brand manager, Phil Pellin, um, after this was in 2000. 13, 14, something like that. He says to me, I think it'd be a great idea if you had a, like a pamphlet, just like a one page kind of a thing on 10 easy steps to, to, to becoming a songwriter or 10 easy steps to get up, to get a publishing deal or, you know, that, that kind of like, and we'll, we'll give it away for a dollar or we'll give it away, you know, and we'll, and cause he wanted to do this tier, you know, I've got consultations and retreats up here and you know, other, what can I do up here? So I sat down and at night I'd be on my computer and my husband had an accident and was laid up 
and my office area is right off the master bedroom so i can close i can kind of close the door and i can see him and you know if he needed me well that went on way too long and uh, this book that was supposed to be 10 pages became 125 <laughs> And that's the reason. Otherwise, it was going to stop and I was going to get it out. And I just kept writing because I was like, Phil, I'm sorry, I can't meet because Brian's got to, I've got to take him here and I got to do this with him. And, you know, there was a, just a lot of stuff to do. And so I was holed up. So I just kept writing and writing and writing. <laughs> Again, divine intervention, right? Because um, I'm really, really proud of that. And, um, proud of the fact that I wrote it for, you know, the 16 year old who says to their parent, what I want to be a songwriter, what do I do? You know, but I'm most proud of the fact that I wrote it for the parents of that songwriter who says to them, what do I do? And now they have like a handbook and go, okay, this is what you got to do. <laughs> you know, yeah, because it's, there's a lot to writing songs. There's a lot to it. There's rhyming. Like I said, there's rhyming schemes and metaphors and similes and how you, you know, introduce theme. And there's a whole plethora of things to teach about songwriting. In, in my opinion, that comes next. Mm -hmm. The first step is creating a foundation, creating a foundation for your career that you can build on. I am about planting roots so that your tree trunk is so strong that if you want to have branches with leaves and not a problem, but I want to make sure that the, the, the process, the foundation, the tree trunk is is solid so that you can have a career. And that's, I think, another thing I'm most proud of is that, you know, I would say 98% of the writers that I've signed, that I signed and developed have amazing careers and and have never been one hit wonders. Mm. No, they have. I have one of my most successful songwriters has never had a number one hit. Top 10, top five, top 40, top album cuts, blah, blah, you know. But when you you get on a Macy Gray album that sells four million, like it used to, you know, used to make money off the album sales. Um, you know, you could, you could have a song that was not a single and make money. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but they all have great careers because they have foundations. Mm -hmm. They have, I have one writer who's got the same business manager I put him with 25 years ago and is invested and has, you know, invested his money and didn't spend it like the first year he got it. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things in what you said. I want to make sure I don't skip or, or, or miss it. One is about the songwriting and how it does resonate with us. You know, there's a, re you, as you said, there's so much into songwriting. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that because there's a reason why we remember lyrics four decades on. And there's also a reason why we have melodies four decades on. We still remember those. Me so there's got to be something in it that reaches in there and touches us so, for some re reason. It's well, we're, we're 60% water. Mm -hmm. So we're malleable. Okay. And we're energy. Okay. Music has no tangible form unless you put it on a record. Okay. But when you say, where's your song? It's like, well, the word, the words are coming out of the melody, but there's no tangibleness to it. That vibration, when you sing, the vibration of the note enters your body differently than when you talk. Mm -hmm. It's like the, I always say it's like talking is like the fish are in the fish tank and they're just, everything's very, it's like right there. And then you go in and you put your hand in and everything goes, that's what singing is. So that vibration reaches our soul, reaches the energy, like reach it to me. I always say it, it massages my liver and my kidneys and everything else that I can't see, when I ah, uh, when I vibrate a note, I mean it. It vibrates all through my body. That's why it's like so important that everyone sings. But that vibration is what heals us. Oh, yeah. There's a, a great quote that you know, um, the our our music is one of our fifth elements. We have fire, water, air, and earth, and that music is one of our five elements. 
And if, if music was gone tomorrow, we wouldn't die. If fire, air, earth, or water were gone, we would die. But if music was gone tomorrow, we would not die. However, if music was gone tomorrow, we would die. Mm -hmm. Because it is the main source of healing our souls. And the reason we remember those lyrics is because that's how we learn. That's how we heal. That's how we celebrated. Those lyrics are part of us. They say what we can't say. They express so many things. There was a, I remember leaving Warner Chapel after 20 years and I was leaving the business really after 30 some years. And I was going to go out on my own. I remember leaving the parking lot and pulling over and just crying. And I was listening to a song by a woman named Rosie Golan. And it, it, um, the song is called, um, um, it's been a year. It's, it's been a year. Been, been a, it's, I think it's called, it's been a year. And it talks about how, boy, that was a day and that was a month and that was years and how, and it was just my whole thing of like, Warner Chapel was like, it, it, it wasn't just like I was gone. I mean, it took a few years for this to like to unravel. And that song, I, I couldn't listen to that song probably for a year. I would put it on when I wanted to cry, when I wanted to just express that. And that's what it did for me. Uh, and, and I will always, that song has a place in my heart. I don't cry when I listen to it as much anymore, but, but that was my healing outlet for that year. Better than any therapist, any, anything else I could have done. I just cried to that song. So powerful. Yeah. So powerful. Yeah. Very powerful. And um, because, you know, that was a huge chunk of your life, mm -hmm. a huge chunk of your soul. And I believe when we when we meet other people, the people you worked with, the people you helped progress, you signed, you developed, you mentored, that bond doesn't break, just like a, a breakup, just no. like a lover, just like that. Yeah. That bond is still there. So yeah. you may not even be in touch, but there's still a, a thread, I believe, an energetic thread there that connects you and keep because you are a part of that. You oh. you it's and that's I think that's why I never wanted to leave that. It's that the 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 feeling that I get being connected to all of this is overwhelmingly beautiful. It, there's just so much love in it. You know, I um I reached out to to I, I mean I reach out to songwriters all the time that you know all of a sudden I'll like oh my god I heard this on the radio you know it's like I I haven't heard it in a long time and it made me think of you and we'll we'll hook up you know we'll we'll talk and yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. Amazing career, yeah. really. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then for uh, raying on into your own your own business and doing the retreats and everything else, have you got any other interests? What else are you doing? The books, the art, you know, you're an author. You still you mentioned earlier that you have a song out. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want, please sing me, send me a link. I'll put it in the show notes. Oh, well. great. I will I will do that. I will do that right now. Um, I, you know what I, I, right now I'm, I'm in the mode of doing whatever's asked of me. <laughs> I'm saying yes to a lot of things. Um, I write, I sell, I write every week. I, um, I have a, I have a, a couple of friends now that come over on Thursday nights and we sing. We've picked about five or six songs that we love to sing. And so we, we keep introducing new songs, but, um, it's just really fun to just sing and get that, you know, get the energy moving. Um, I do yoga. I love my dog. I hike every day with them. I, I mean, him, her, blah, blah. Where did that come from? Um, I, I love people. I'm, I'm all about connecting with my friends and family. I have two goddaughters. I have two, two amazing now what would they be? Grand goddaughters. <laughs> so I have little babies now in the, in the family. And uh, yeah, I mean, my life is very, very rich, very, I'm, I'm so full of abundance. It's, it's like, whatever I do, I'm just, I'm, I really love my life right now. I really do. So it all kind of goes together, you know, it all kind of goes together. So 
music is always a part of it. I love to go to the theater. I love to go to shows. Um, you know, that's, I'm kind of up for anything, you know? Yeah. Wonderful though. And what would you say to someone who thinks that they may have some type of creative gift that they may be a songwriter, that they could be, you know, how we all think sometimes. Well, I could. Yeah. What would you say to someone who's thinking that right now? Well, the first thing I, I would do is I would assess yourself on, first of all, I would look at yourself and go, okay, I really want to do this. What, what like research, I would do a lot of research on what is a songwriter and what does that look like? And I mean, you can go to my website. There's a lot of tutorials on what you need to do and so forth and so on. But let's say you get to the point you're like, you know what? I really want to do this. What do I do? It's reaching out to get someone to help you. It's getting that assessment. It's, you know, if, if you're having, you know, a lot of you know, if you're depressed, you call a psychologist and you go, okay, you know, psychiatrist and go, okay, I'm depressed. I got to figure this out. You know, I've got a thorn in my side. I got to go to a doctor. I got to figure this out. You know, it's, I want to be a songwriter. Who do I need to call? What do I need to do? Where can I go get assessed so I can figure out what I need to do? I mean, that's what a consultation usually is. You know, I mean, the first consultation is about assessing where you are and what you need to do. If consultation like for me you know you could you could do a consult for an hour you could also send a song that you've written and do a song critique which is a lot cheaper and now it's only i get on the zoom for 10 minutes and we go over your song and there's no, there's no guiding you know there's no what's your story and we don't listen to it but i sit there and i go okay let me tell you actually this this happened recently where there's a young woman who wants to come to one of my retreats and She's never really done this before. And she said, but I'm just writing lyrics. That's all I'm doing. So I said, uh, okay. So she sent in a song so that I could, you know, see. And I emailed her back and said, you mean you just like vomit? You like really didn't even write, like this is just what came out of you when you haven't really done anything to it. I'm like, you're a natural. You're fantastic. It doesn't matter if you don't say, send me some other things so I can see them, you know? Um, and she just... This woman is just like, they're just pouring out of her. She needed to be assessed. She needed someone. Oh, okay. the other thing, like in, 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 in my community, you can pay for a one-on-one -on -one consultation. You can pay for a song critique. And then at, on, at noon on Pacific Standard Time on Sundays, I do a Facebook Live from 12 to 1 free. So anybody can come to it. And I actually, I can't listen to songs, but I can critique lyrics. If somebody wants to bring me a lyric on a Sunday, I can go, fantastic, but your second verse, let's work on that. You know, I can, I can do that. Or if somebody has a question or, if so, you know, it's all about giving advice, answering questions, discussing things, but I'm there for free from 12 to one. That is fantastic. So it's, if you want it, it's out there. You have to do the research. And viewers, I will put the link uh, to all, mm. excuse me, all of the links will be in the show notes. A couple of quick questions before we mm. end. Um, you know, we like to get a little bit philosophical here. So I just wonder, do you, can you remember the very first record you ever bought or was given? Sometimes we're given our first uh, record. Um. I want to say, oh boy, it's so funny you ask this because I just went through my mom's house and I found my my orange and white striped little box that held all my 45s. That's amazing you have that. Well, I want the thing that comes to mind is Moody Blues, Nights in White Satin. I think it was before that. I think there was there was maybe something before that, but I just remember... I mean, that was, that, that was, that was like the record that I just over and over and over again. Yeah. So what did, do you remember if you bought that or was it given to you? Oh, I probably went and bought it. Ah, okay. That's how I went, brought, brought, went and bought it. Yeah, my, we, we had allowances and that's how I spent all, I would go and buy records and you could go down to the record store and you could go into these little booths and listen to the record. <gasps> oh, it was so magical. It's yeah, right down the street. Yeah. Okay, yes. 
because I think I I always think our first uh, records really do shape us a little bit. They kind of give us this um, idea of what we resonate with or what melodies and everything. We grow, we change, we yeah. change. But well, it's funny. My parents listened to a lot of Frank Sinatra and, you know, that, I mean, I was raised on all of that, but I'd be in my room and my two favorite, along with Nights in Wine Satin was the Led Zeppelin album, uh -huh. Stairway to Heaven. And it was like those two, two albums. And it's like Frank Sinatra, Led Zeppelin, you know? <laughs> oh, actually, you know what? It's probably a Monkees record that I bought or a Beatles record that I bought. You know, that was, yeah, Night, Moody Blues was later. It was either a Beatles or a Monkees record at at the drugstore that the Savons down the street. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's what it probably was. Do you remember that long ways to Clarksville? What was it by, by the Monkees? Oh, it's a long way to Clarksville, and I'll meet you wow. at the station. Oh, wow! And the yeah. TV show. Oh my goodness! Oh my god! Oh. Davy Jones. Yeah. You know, it's been really refreshing hearing your take because there's so much negativity to, out there talking about the music business at the moment. Mm. Um, and yes, it's changed. And we could all be like the old woman shouting at clouds or something, you know, <laughs> oh, it's all changed. But mm -hmm. uh, your take on it is refreshing because, of course, it's changed. However, as yeah. you really outlined here, these resources still exist record companies still exist they are still developing and helping artists mm -hmm. just in a different way it hasn't right. gone away completely right it's saying there's no more in r there's no more artist development well there is mm -hmm. i'm hearing it yeah. from an expert who knows <laughs> yeah you have to be in that development process mm. though you know to stand out here and go they don't do this it's like, you know, you, you, when you're developing yourself, you're going to find some A&R people that aren't going to develop to your liking. So you got to go find the ones that do to your liking, but to stand here and go, it's, you know, that that's the, po the polarization, excuse me, the polarization of everything, which will, it just keeps you separated. So. Yeah. And music, uh, you know, moves us uh, to cry, mm -hmm. to dance, to laugh. I always say, you know, to to be silent, right. to be alone, right. to make love, to do all these things. We're inspired by music always, and so everybody though doesn't have that resonance. Why do you think that is? Why do you think some people just don't get into music? I I've had neighbors before who. You know, you, you, you're friendly with them. You go around and they are like, yeah, no, we don't, we don't listen to music. <laughs> uh, I personally don't understand it. No, I don't. There was an IT guy in our, at, at Warren Chapel. He'd come over and fix my computers. All the, I missed him so much when I left. Um, and uh, I was trying to give him records all the time. He was like, no, I don't listen to music. I was like, how do you not listen to, like, what? Yeah. Um I just, I think it's probably how some people are raised. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do too. Yeah, because yeah. we, we tend, yeah, I think so. You know, it's interesting though, because when we were talking before, is, you know, it's, we're so much energy. It, if someone's not used to it, mm -hmm. it might be a little overwhelming. It could be. I never thought about that. Yes. No, that's, that's, a, yeah. that's to have someone, coming at them with these words and these melodies and all of a sudden they're, you know, it, you're, they're inside them. And it's like, what's that feeling? What's that, what's going on? And they're not used to it. And they might just shut it down. Oh. Yeah. I, I, it's foreign to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, even with, um, you know, I make CDs to help people hypnotherapy therapeutically and to relax mm. and things like that. And I always put a little bit of music alpha waves on, because it does change the brain waves, you know, it changes yes. your body consistency and it does help you to relax a little bit. Mm -hmm. To not, like, people you just fall asleep so quickly, I used to think, oh no, my voice, it's, uh, I need to change it or something. But no, it was relaxing for people. So. <laughs> yeah. 
But That's Susie, great. I, I've learned so much today. I mean, oh, incredible. I'm so glad. And your career, I mean, you know, you must look back with fondness. But also, yeah. I would think, you know, it's okay to be proud of what you've done. Oh, <laughs> I'm, you to do. I am. I'm, pr I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what they all became, of yeah. what they all did. You know, I mean, that's, I think that's the teacher in me. My mother was a teacher for, you know, you know I think that that got passed down because it's just you. Yeah, there's a lot of pride. There's yeah. a lot of pride. And we need teachers like you. And as your mother said early on in your career, what, what is that? What is that? I just find that fascinating because there's so many careers out there that people just don't know about. Right. And I know. That was one of them. And I don't know if people still know about your work, you know, what you do and that it, the job exists. It's interesting because I've had to educate much more than I thought, you know, being in the music business, being at Warner Chapel, I never had to explain to anybody what I did. And all of a sudden you're outside and it's like, nobody knows really that this is available, you know? Yes. I don't know why I want to ask this, but do you did you ever come across Ahmed Erdogan? From Ahmed, Ahmed Erdogan? Yeah. Um, yes. I, I never really worked okay, yeah. closely with him. Actually, my sister worked Close, closer than I think I did. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. She was uh she was uh running a little small record company through through Atlantic. So um years and years ago. But he's a great man. Great, great man. I mean, just everybody that worked for him at Atlantic just, you know, thought the things the world of him. So yeah. I know I used to hear all Zeppelin going on about how great he was, but um, and I may cut this out at the interview, but because I, you know, I have mediumistic skills, these weird things come in for me. And I was just about to give my outro saying, you know, thank you so much. And I just got this vision of a, a dark, kind of a darkish man uh you know hair slicked back coming yeah. going mention armit mention armit mention armit oh i love that that's, oh, that's so, so cool weird so you said your sister worked with him well well, well my sister ran a really small record company through uh -huh. atlantic so she had a little bit more closer dealings but oh. that, that was years and years and years ago that was very very short-lived um the yeah, I never really worked with him. I mean, I was in the room with him a couple of times, but, you know, that was about it. But like my buddies over at Atlantic that worked directly with him were just like, he's just the greatest. He gets on the phone. It's kind of like Clive. Right. You know, like you had these guys in the music business that were they're legendary, yeah. you know, and their power was, it was a quiet power. You know, it was, it was, um, yeah, I miss them. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, Clive is still with us. Um, oh, of course. But, but uh, so do you never have any contact or anything with, I mean, people go their separate ways and that's it sometimes, I guess. But, and he's retired. He reti oh, with Clive. Actually, I, I mean, I haven't seen Clive in years. I, um, I had an artist that Clive signed, one of his last signings before he, he left BMG. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, his name is Paul Freeman. Um, and the album, the album came out. It was just, it was great, great little album. He's done more independently than he did on the album because that was years ago. But it was one of the last signings Clive did. He got into his office and got to hang out with him, and it was just, it was like being on old times, you know. Amazing! Oh, yeah. what a what an exciting place to be. I mean, yeah. you've seen it when it was because record companies. If you could, the Capitol Building was infamous in oh. it. You know, I know it's still there, isn't it? But Daisy, yeah. when I used to work at Capitol at the like this was in the uh 80s, um, they used to have these parking lot um record sales. So they used to take all the records and you could go and buy anything from their catalog for like four dollars. Yeah, I have the whole Beatles collection in somewhere in here. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Like that tower was just so infamous. It's so amazing. Yeah, it is, it and is. the studio there too is great. Remember there was a studio yeah. there, but wasn't yeah. the tower records just up the road? Um, the tower was on sunset. Oh, that's right. Of sunset course. and Kings road. Yeah. Uh, I miss that. That was such a hang. 
It was. You go there at 11 o'clock on a Friday night and like run into all the A&R people, you know, all the publisher. It like, it's like people would just be hanging because again, that's where you'd find, you'd read the back of the albums to, to find out who produced it and the lyrics. And, you know, there was so much information and looking at all the album covers and oh, I miss that. That was such an experience. It was, and it is missing. And I know I'm the lady shouting at the clouds, but it's like, come on, <laughs> I, I miss that bit. I miss yeah. the smell and the lyrics and everything. Children these days just do not have it. It was a well, it's instant gratification. We had to, I, I remember coming home with like the James Taylor album and having a few friends over and it was like putting it on and sitting down and all of us listening because you there was no other place to listen to it. Yeah. It, yep. it shaped our lives, but um, yep. oh my goodness, I could talk to you for ages. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope you're you so have, welcome, especially when your book comes out as well. Oh, uh, I'll you. let you know. Yes. I'm going to send you all. Thank you. And have a great You're rest welcome. Of day. You too. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time.